There are other drops. I did speak about timonol, beta blocker. If you put more than one drop of beta blocker, with, and beta blocker is in lots of combination. Most of the people, if they're using more than one medication, they are usually on beta blockers. And if you're using more than one drop, the two drops of timonol are equal to 10 milligram of tablet. And that's a lot of dose. So it's important again, and that's again the importance of support group, that drop technique, that punctal occlusion, so that you avoid absorption. So if you're using it correctly, if you're using the correct tools, one drop is going in your eye, and you're closing, and you're not getting the side effects. Next question. What is the problem with antihistamines and some sleeping tablets that are contraindicated for patients with glaucoma? Pharmacies will never sell them to me. Antihistamines and even now in your anticholinergics, lots of drugs for the bladder, which one of them is set up from. Somebody did ask about set up from. I think there's one question on their side which I saw. The newer drugs, they can affect your pressure control. But they are more serious if you've got angle closure glaucoma. John mentioned about the angle closure glaucoma. Angle closure glaucoma, if we were to say, it's very uncommon in Caucasian population. But that is a 10 year old thing. You know, 10 years ago, uh, probably our survival rate was less and we were having cataract surgery. Angle closure glaucoma is becoming commoner in previously open angle cases. So if you had an open angle glaucoma and if you not had the cataract operation, with time you are at risk of developing ang uh, angle closure glaucoma. And that's why most of the time whenever I'm doing the surgery, I try to do the first cataract or I try to do the combined so that we can tackle that issue because lens is becoming big for your eye. So if you are clear that you've got open angle glaucoma, you have been you remember saying that that's why on the e-card when it will work. You can write what is your diagnosis. So you can just always check what is my diagnosis. If you were diagnosed with angle closure glaucoma, it's likely that we would have done the laser treatment or we would have done the cataract surgery. Then you are not at risk. You can safely take those medications. But if you have not had the angle closure glaucoma, and no one patient sitting here, okay, because first side surgery, our surgical outcome was not very good. We have not done, I think, either laser <coughs> or cataract surgery. So those patients need to be very careful if you're having these medications and if you start to develop pain or redness in your eye, it is important to report to a acute clinic before it becomes too bad. But majority of the patients will have open angle glaucoma, so no concern. If they are diagnosed with angle closure glaucoma, they will have laser treatment or cataract surgery. And I remember, I think in the last seven, eight years, there is only one patient I know where none of those two things are done for a reason. Okay. okay. Uh, my eyes keep filling with grit and seem to have a film of slime. What causes this? And is there anything I can do to try and ease the situation? John, would you like to answer that? No. Uh, it's likely. Uh, this is a reaction to a poor tear film, maybe combined with irritation from the drops. So that um, instead of the film of tears working properly, it's patchy, uh, the parts of the eye become dry, and the mucus is not being cleared away properly. And that will be associated with discomfort, soreness, the eyes feeling tired, particularly when using a computer, when our blink rate reduces. And the irritation from eye drops tends to exacerbate this. So this is a nuisance, generally, rather than a serious problem. And there are a number of things that can be done. Sometimes one particular drop is causing more, than, more irritation than um, is ideal. We would like to change the drop. Other times, attention to um, the health of the eyelid edges can be very helpful and other times an artificial tear can be helpful. But if you're using an artificial tear on top of your glaucoma drops, 
there's going to be extra drops going in the eye, and I would recommend that sort of situation going for a preservative-free artificial tear, so that we're just not adding any more preservatives to the eye. It's very important, you know, Bob, that to take care of the surface. You know, the reason I use that term, the toilet cleaner, cleaner the preservative, is, uh, is for a reason. Because slowly, with time, with years of oil eye drops, your surface does become a bit rough and it does require some care. And your lids, you know, lids produces some fluids, which part of the tear film to keep it lubricated they get slowly inflamed as well and they produce bad quality oil and for that reason few of the things again there is a video on eye hygiene you know you could watch uh, a <laughs> video on eye hygiene how to keep the eyes clean and information leaflet on blepharitis which you could <laughs> uh, you could again download there are two information on leaflet on blepharitis and it explains what to do the key thing which I would you like you to remember and not forget, if you are using lubricant eye drops with glaucoma treatment, use them after you use the glaucoma drops. The lubricant eye drops are a viscous solution and you put in your eye for next two hours, nothing will be absorbed. So if you put the uh, artificial tear in your eye and then you are trying to do the glaucoma drop, that glaucoma drop is going complete waste and your pressure must be up. So that's a very important message. Apart from doing the regular cleaning, the way you can see the website video, you can download the leaflet. There are two information <coughs> leaflet and we might be keep updating these leaflets as well. Uh, but at the moment they are absolutely up to date and do read through those. If I tell you all those things you will forget, but uh, important thing one, if you're using <coughs> the and eye drops with glaucoma drops, use them after the glaucoma drops. The next question. I take amiodarone daily because of atrial fibrillation. Does this have any effect on the condition of my arm? Would you like to answer? Um, the common effect of amiodarone <coughs> is um, an effect on the corneas surface cells. They have a particular pattern called a vortex, which um, is only really visible uh, with a microscope. So opticians may notice this and uh, may ask for an opinion about it. It's almost always um, without, it's asymptomatic. It doesn't generally cause symptoms. Very unusual to cause any symptoms. And usually the amiodarone is being given for a good reason. So it should not be stopped. And this pattern, if it's seen, is not a reason for stopping the amiodarone. Um, carry on. Thank you. Can we take our opening drop to the pressure yet? Uh, it was Astrani in America. He had come up with a handheld pressure <coughs> measure. Man, think that you can do it at home. Uh, not yet, unless you have you've got about 30,000 spare <laughs> and you can buy an ocular response analyzer at home and then somebody can, you can train somebody at home uh, to do that. It's, it's about 30k, so you can do that and that's fine. Like it much cheaper to go to the operation. There's another cheaper one, not a cheaper one, it's for the kids, it's called eye care tonometer. It's about Three, no, it's not 300, it's about definitely two and a half thousand pounds. We, we bought three of them and I was trying to negotiate the price down, but they only gave for three for six and a half thousand pounds. So it's about 2300 pounds. But that is, uh, I'm pretty sure you'll be a bit scared to use it because it shoots a kind of a arrow, goes onto your eye, touches your eye, and then I don't think it's useful for you to do it yourself. <laughs> Surgery a year ago, I have recently noticed a sticky yellow discharge in my right eye, mostly in the morning. Is there anything I can do to clear this? Again, one is sticky eye is again ocular surface and yellow discharge is probably a little bit of infection going on. So, but if you just properly clean with hot bathing with a lid hygiene, that is the first thing to do. 
if that does not relieve the thing, you may require, and if it is getting worse, you may require a course of antibiotics. But in our body, just in taking care of the eye with proper drop technique and pro proper lid hygiene, that's the key thing. That's why those two videos are on the, our home page. You know, I asked for, for that purpose, I, I, I did ask Sally that on our home page, there are, there are three videos on the home page. If it works. Uh, yeah. There are three videos at the bottom of the home page. And two of them, one is on how to do the drops and one is to how to keep your eyes clean. So those two videos, and that's what, again, those are the most commonly watched videos. And there are 70 reviews of the, uh, 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 these videos. Next question. Could we have some information on the best diet for our eye health? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was watching this program yesterday. Hey, what was it yesterday? It was coming on uh, vitamin, you know, a few other supplements. What is best? It was coming on vitamin D. Whether sunlight is good, or whether dietary supplements are good, or whether diet is good. With regards to diet, you know, the typical answer is anything which contains, like carrots and whichever, which contains these kind of pigment, those kind of food are good. But I also remember another discussion on BBC4, which you know everybody will remember iron content of spinach. Mm -hmm. So it was a there was a study which is published in one of the uh, good journal. They can all these assumptions that these things are good for us are based on the studies done in 60s. <coughs> this this people uh, this group check the iron content of spinach, and that study was done in 1993. And they compared the old record, you know, just like old houses are so much better than the new, newly made houses. The old spinach in 1943 contained double the amount of iron content in spinach in 1993. So whatever is claimed, uh, whether you get all the benefit, but yes, good diet, all the good diet and good living, that's a simple message. Uh, do you need to take too many supplements? I'm not pretty convinced about, do you do AMD clinic? Yeah. We do advise some supplements. Which are, which one are you advising? Um, well, the, I think the issue with the, the supplements is that, that um, for macular degeneration, if someone has a pretty good diet anyway, it's, it seems to be a bit debatable what extra the supplements can do. And some people even feel that there may be micronutrients in a good diet that are not in the supplements. But um, if somebody uh, is, for some reason, not having a good diet, then having one of these um, supplements that are designed for um, macular degeneration may well be appropriate. So I don't discourage them. But I, I don't feel I positively promote them. Some of the studies that they're based on were financed by the drug companies, and you kind of think, well, let's, you know, my grandmother said spinach, and maybe that maybe has some wisdom. Yeah, the, the good diet is definitely a big key thing. Thanks, John. I remember another paper. You know, as as a doctor, you need to read so so many papers. But this was on especially in macular degeneration preparation. And there are lots of companies who are trying to make, make quick bucks on that. And it was published in 2009 or 2010. And they compared what should be the concentration of these nutrients. And not a single product had all the nutrients in correct combination. So again, the simple thing is con good control of your blood pressure, good control of your weight. If you've got cholesterol control, cholesterol, <coughs> healthy diet, and walking. Those are the best things still for glaucoma as well. You know, these are the common sense things. Uh, the glaucoma is the nervous part of your body. Its blood supply is related to how in general blood supply is going to be. So whatever keeps you healthy, take one. Could my eye medications be irritating my skin conditions which appear to be resistant to the normal treatment? If it is around the eye, possibly yes. Uh, 
one or two, one particular group of drug, which is our carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, they can have some sensitivity reactions, uh, but particularly they will be only manifesting in one part of the skin, that's unlikely. If it is close to your eye and it is getting worse, then it could be repeated rubbing with the tissues. I've seen a lot of skin reaction because of people who use so many uh, tissues, rubbing against the skin constantly. And if you are bathing your eye in the, this uh, drop as this preservative going on the skin, in the long term they can affect your skin. But directly affecting the skin condition, no. But if you're using treatment for a skin condition, and if that is a steroid ointment, then that can affect your glaucoma. So if you're rubbed, taking the steroid cream, and with your finger you're putting it there, it will be absorbed and eventually it is going to affect your glaucoma. So if you're using anything new medication, it's always uh, useful to inform the consultant. One of the few questions I ask, one of the important questions I ask, is there any change in general health? Have you started any new medication? So if you prepare those questions before you're going there, if there's any change, it's, if doctor has not asked, it's useful use, use to mention that this has happened, Mr. Shah. You're going to ask this this time. I'm sure it will happen in my clinic now. You'll all say, oh, you didn't ask this question. <laughs> do remind me, because sometimes I, I might be far too busy. Okay. Uh, my optician recently suggested that my next glasses have a film over the lens protect the eyes from blue light. The extra cost seems high. Is there any benefit to this lens film? And precisely, what is the difference between UV, blue light and others, and are they effective? Um, yes. I think that um, some people's perception of, of, if someone has a visual disability, then maybe uh, tint in the glasses can be um, beneficial to them. That you do see people with visual disability sometimes having um, glasses with the or uh, eye shields with particular tints in. But in terms of um, protecting the eye against short wavelength light, um, in general terms, I don't think there's anything to be gained by trying to reduce the amount of blue light. But there is. Uh, potential benefit in reducing ultraviolet light exposure to the eyes. I have an ultraviolet filter in these glasses. You can't see it at all. Um, it costs about £30 extra. I'm not very persuaded that much ultraviolet light gets to the back of the eye in someone over the age of 40 who has their natural lens still in. In other words, they haven't had cataract surgery. And I think a lot of intraocular lenses have an ultraviolet filter in them. So I don't think much ultraviolet light is getting to the back of the eye in adults. But the cornea can be affected, and the uh, surface skin of you can be affected. And people who are outdoors a lot, hiking or skiing or sailing, often have degeneration in the white skin of the eye, uh, pterygium, and the um, surface skin of the eye is less um, fresh and white and healthy. There's also a risk of some skin cancers around the eyelids, uh, which is just a nasty place to have a skin cancer. So I think that having an ultraviolet filter in the lens of glasses does have a small benefit, and on balance, I would recommend it. Thank you, John. Can laser surgery damage your sight? What is its success rate? It all depends which laser surgery you are talking about. <laughs> there are lots of laser treatment and it's not clear. Is that person here in the audience? Do you want to ask about a specific laser? It's not okay, all right. So, well, for glaucoma, one laser is to deal with the angle closure glaucoma and that laser would be essential. And potentially, Anything which is done to your eye can affect your eye. I've seen it with all lasers. It happens with very small, you know, with different, one laser is safer over the other, that's the only thing. YAG laser, it's done in hundreds of thousands of patients, but I have seen a case report where there was a macular hole following YAG, peripheral arrhythmia, and that 
case I had seen and I had published that in 2002. Uh, organ laser trabecular plasty is and selective laser trabecular plasty. These are two laser treatment for glaucoma, for open angle glaucoma, and I'm assuming most of the people sitting here are talking about that because that is one potential additional drop. Argon laser trabeculoplasty and selective laser trabeculoplasty achieves more or less similar success rate, but the paradoxical rise in pressure is much higher with argon laser trabeculoplasty after the laser treatment because it has thermal effect. The, it, the, the newer laser is works through non-thermal mechanism and that's why that paradoxical rise probability is much less. Both of these should not, I've not seen anybody losing vision because of the laser treatment, especially SLT. ALT, there were some cases earlier on when people were using far too much power. Now, different people do the laser differently and it's important that the experienced person does and we ensure that experienced people do the laser treatment and we get very good results with ALT in trust and uh, SLT is not available on NHS. Unfortunately, it was launched in 2008, effectively in the market, where the financial prices came. And that laser we cannot use for anything else, while argon laser, ALG treatment, that laser used for diabetics, for other purposes, and it makes much more business sense for NHS to have that laser. When I get next big chunk of money, you know, <laughs> I'm going to buy that laser. If I get a space, at the moment we are struggling for space and some of the equipment. At the moment, except for SLD, I think we've got majority, most of the top of the range, high quality instrumentation and booster. And it all started, you know, my efforts started through the support of one of our patients. He is no longer with us, unfortunately, but he donated a good reasonable amount of money. It was only, uh, you know, whatever it was, I put a grant on the basis of that. Uh, this is an interesting story and you are all part of the Shushar Makama support group, so you should know how I played that game and I won. There was, I learned about a national grant available for instrumentation and I had this about 2K in glaucoma support to fund. What I knew that they are going to give about 60K for this grant, but if you have, they will not pay the whole cost. So the letter I wrote, I read, I wrote that I've got these three counties, people have to travel here and there, and uh, I need to buy this instrument, and I'm falling short by 60,000 pounds. If you can give me 60,000 pounds, I didn't tell them that. Instrument cost 62,000 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'm falling short by 60,000 pounds, and luckily I got it. <laughs> and then I, I asked the League of Friends and Alex because I wanted the 120,000 pound, uh, 140,000 pound instrument. So I went to them and I said, if you can give me 40K, I can negotiate better with the company. So they gave me 40K. And I negotiated a price from 140k to 100k because it was bought through the charity. So that's how the glaucoma support groups, that 1200 pound donation led to instrument award 163 with VAT. <laughs> Next question. If there are any, anybody else has any other question, please ask now. You know, this is a free round. Anybody can raise hand and ask question. Yeah. <coughs> yes. There is a hereditary component in the in glaucoma, open angle glaucoma. That's why your kids, your uh, uh, you know, relatives after the age of 40, they are entitled for free eye test at opticians to get the pressure checked the correct way to pick up if you are developing, uh, developing early signs of glaucoma. And uh, it's not that it is definitely directly proportional that if you got it, your son has to have it. It might skip a few generations. 
but yes, there is a hereditary component. That is one of the frequently asked questions as well on the website. Anybody else want to ask the question before we read the next question? Yeah. If I dry the eyes with a single ply tissue after putting in the drops, there's a big wet patch on the tissue afterwards. The wet patch is nearly as big as when one puts a whole drop direct on the tissue. Does this mean that most of every eye drop is wasted? The, when, when you put these eye drops, and if they have those preservatives, they can cause what is called reflex tearing. You know, there is a, when, when, when you're putting something, there will be a little bit of eye response as well. As soon as you get, you feel a little bit of irritation, that will cause also a little bit of tearing. That's why it might be a bit more. But it's not a good idea to put the tissue there. It's not, you know, that's why it's important to put the eye drop and close it <coughs> here. And if it, this area is a bit wet, then it will be wet. Because if you're putting the tissue, it might be soaking. It's, a, it's a, the whole the drop coming out to the tissue. So it's not a good idea to immediately put tissue there. Any other questions? Yeah? Um, Dr. Carla before was saying about um, when you have the bright white light, you see the colors around it sometime at night. <coughs> what would the next sort of, what would you have to do? Dr. Carla, uh, yeah. John, yeah, thank you. Um, so this acute angle closure where the iris and the cornea block off the angle to the drainage channels and the pressure shoots up. Um, the symptoms, just to repeat them, will be an ache in the eye or sometimes in the forehead. That's usually severe, but not always. Feeling of sickness, misty vision with a colored halo around a white light. So, the and sometimes that's an on and off thing. It tends to happen in dim light in the evenings. And um, it does need urgent attention but if, as a first aid measure, supposing you're in a hotel in, the, in Thailand or something, what I would do is lie flat on your back on the bed and switch on the ceiling light and look at the ceiling light. And the light will make the pupil smaller and the gravity of lying on your back will make the lens sink backwards a bit and allow more space to develop. But you would still need to get it checked out the next day. It is different uh, from um, classical migraine, which is the other thing which is sometimes confused with, because classical migraine also gives a, a one-sided headache, usually, and um, a disturbance of vision, which can be a, a kind of colored rainbow effect. That tends to be not just a complete halo, but more usually just a half circle or arc. So the first aid measure will be to lie on your back and look at a bright light on the ceiling. But you can get these halos from different reasons as well. You know, it's not that all this angle closure attack as well. So if you're not having any pain and uh, there's no other discharge going on. No, it's not, it's not all the time. <coughs> and then it won't be working for say 12 hours or something. Tiredness maybe. Uh, tiredness, it, it, it means there is some kind of edema in the optic refractive pathway or there is a lot of secretion. Uh, or there might be tear film. But if there is a coronal opacity, if there is something else, <laughs> it, that might be caused. It's basically optical phenomena. You know, the light strikes any edge and it diffracts in different direction. And sometimes these different swellings can act as prisms. And that's why you see halo. You know, especially if you would remember, if you've done swimming for a one hour, then you come out and look at the outer swimming pool and then. Everybody will see those colored halos. That's because there is a bit of swelling. There's a surface issue. If you're using four or five drops, it could be the drop toxicity, which may mimic those kind of symptoms. But if it's ha happening occasionally, I'm not worried about it unless there's a specific pain. Yep. One of the drops, which are like currently used, uh, is a suspension and leaves white residue in the corner of the eye after application. Should I leave it there or? Once a few minutes have passed after that, you can wipe it. You know, it's two minutes, if it stayed in the clear film, enough will be absorbed to give you the good result. But yes, that residue, it must be gazed off. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So that, that, that's usually three times four. No, they, they, are, they are trying to work with them and trying to train these optometrists to do the same pressure and same visual field test. What we have agreed, what they have agreed, you know, we were against it. It's not our idea, but the visual field, they are using different visual field at the moment. And we are trying to persuade commissioners that in the long term it will be cheaper for them if the patients have the same test. And the, our vision is that we should not only have the same test there, we should have the same health record as well, so that opticians and we can share and we can check what they're doing. So progress will be made, but at very slow pace. And other thing is, a few years down the line, they may give it to a private company, which is a big, big threat. There are private companies mushrooming around the country, you must have read, it was in West of, uh, it was, Sus was it Sussex Hospital or something. The private company came and did the cataract surgery. All this is going to happen. This, there are lots of people who are eyeing on cherry picking. Take the, take their hospital, make, do not make loss or make, save some money to give, you know, Many of you might have noticed, sometimes I give one hour of my time after the operation. Sometimes I have to do one and a half hour operation as you heard uh, previously. That, at that time you're losing money and we gain money by doing some cataracts. Not huge amount, the trust gains some money. But these private companies are coming and doing that. Only way to say that is say no. You know, because government is saying care quality, uh, care closer to the home and patient choice. So remember you have a right to say no if you are not happy. But this, these schemes and these things will come and you have, need to choose where you want to go. Cataract surgery, if you have to wait for another month, it's not going to make a difference. And that's where the biggest loss to the your local hospital is going to be. This, whatever I'm talking is politically incorrect, perhaps. But I don't know. <laughs> There's no MP, but I'm known to be politically incorrect. I just speak whatever comes out uh, in my mind. I just say that. <laughs> there were, yeah. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Um, is this the reason that we're not being sent um, appointments with the consultant after the failed vision test? Because I, I wasn't sent an appointment last time. I, my, my field vision test was March. I kept phoning and asking for my appointment. was told we're not available. I've since had a bleed in the eye that was picked up by my optician. The bleed in the eye is picked up by the optician. That's very good. That's entirely different to the visual field path thing. What we have to... <coughs> but, yeah, <coughs> I'm coming to the follow-up question. You know the why you would not give the... There is a capacity issue, and we all are suffering from capacity issue, and that's why different people are trying to work out how to best manage. There is an absolute huge increase in the disease because of age-related macular degeneration. Up to 2000 and 2002, that was a quick situation in the clinic because we couldn't do anything for those people. We used to see them, we used to do the visual, um, the low vision aid assessment for them, and they were discharged. And from 2009, there is a new injection available for age rate macular degeneration. That is the most common cause of blindness. There are thousands and thousands of people with that. Each person for each eye requires up to 13 injections and 13 visits. Each injection costs the hospital about 2,000 pounds. But suddenly, there's a huge workload increase. So then, we had to rethink how we see people and who is seeing and who is doing what. The whole idea for future is that consult consultant time is utilized in most complex things and we develop pathways so that your visual field is done and it's reviewed by the trained person and your pressures are then checked. Very soon we are going to start the scheme where there will be 
nurse practitioners. We have developed five nurse practitioners in Worcestershire, and they will be assessing the so-called less risky cases. But they are working next door to me. So in future, Sarah, Julie, <coughs> Jack, uh, Julie Manning, those nurses will be doing part of the work which was relatively easy for me. You know, uh, because I, if everything is stable. I don't have to do anything else. You need to carry on with whatever you are carrying on. So it's not that the visual field technicians do look at the visual field test, and if there is no major difference, then it is categorized. And do those are the reasons. We are not perfect. We are struggling just like anybody else, but we are doing the best in the region, and we are among the best uh, for other uh, other things as well. But yes, there is a huge problem of all of patients. But we have reduced the fall of waiting times to some extent and hopefully we'll reduce it but that problem yes that that is a problem which ideally you know, if you were in france or if you were in america for a glaucoma the ideal the, the, that's monetarily driven as well they see every four monthly all the patients with all the tests every four monthly if i were seeing somebody every yearly that means three times the workload because i need to see the same patient three times Per year rather than once a year. So that kind of uh, adjustment has to be made. And but if things change, it is it's automatically shown to the consultant. You know, suppose your visual field is showing significant change, it is highlighted. So can I just ask that if you don't get a follow-up to your field test, you can assume that you're saying No, it's it, it's still useful to call. You know, I'm not saying right. because <laughs> systems there are always issues of system failure. Most of the time when things happen, is a system failure. And if you have not received in that those many months, it is absolutely right to call and find out what has happened. Yeah. Because these things are automatically generated and monitored on computers. <coughs> and you know, one of the things I told Sally, that I want Terry card to work here. And that was the only thing which didn't work. But the computer system, computer system can behave in a different way, so uh, do call if, you, if that happens. We've got last 10 minutes because uh, later on there is another meeting here, isn't it? So any other questions? Any other questions? Yeah? Um, I, a few months back, uh, diagnosed with high blood pressure and then uh, just a few weeks ago recently confirmed by you that I've got bilateral glaucoma. Uh, is there a correlation or not? Because I've been getting mixed messages. Well, as I said, you know, if if you read and sometimes whatever is published and some people say they look for they call it evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine is when if a trial has proven whether this thing happened, you know, it has to be a randomized controlled trial, hundreds of thousand pounds spent before you can make a decision. And another thing is a consultant experience. And it's a common sense thing. Blood pressure, it's not a direct cor correlation that your blood pressure, if your blood pressure is high, your pressure will be high. But if your blood pressure is poorly controlled, your glaucoma may be poorly controlled. Or your end outcomes <coughs> over a <your coughs> lifetime will be less uh, favorable if you have poor control of blood pressure. Whenever in clinic we are giving, trying to give advice, we are trying to zoom out and see where things are going to be in the next 20, 30, 40 years for you, for that eye. That's why we advise uh, different interventions. But blood pressure, if it is poorly controlled, it affects the blood supply to the nerve. If blood supply to the nerve is affected, you know, the way, the mechanism is not pressure, actually, mechanism is failed autoregulation. The optic nerve has ability to control the blood flow to its, itself and that gets altered in glaucoma. So if your blood pressure is playing up, that will have some role. Exactly how, nobody knows because there is no evidence. But yes, it does have some effect and it's best to control it. There was... Yes, we yeah. I was wondering about the latest, is there any sort of stem cell research or anything like that going into glaucoma? Stem cell research in glaucoma, it is, you 
in a very, very early stages. There are, uh, at the moment, most of the pharmaceutical companies don't see much money there, essentially. That's a true answer. A stem cell research is still being done because there are some pockets in the world where good research is being done at the moment. And, but not for, it's not an advanced stage, so perhaps no, I'll be very happy with that if it happens in my lifetime of practicing glaucoma cells and that it comes that we can implant stem cells into the optic nerve. But to give you an example, the reason glaucoma is that complex, because optic nerve is the most complex nerve in the eye. It carries information in those fibers, take information about the, the form what is the form or shape, the contrast, the color, all that and the orientation, spatial orientation and timely <coughs> correlation and then fusing that, those images. So that is an exceptionally complex pathway. So I don't see that happening in at least 30 years time. The, I remember when I was a trainee at that time, these, these research were going on and we were thinking about injecting RPE and for age written vector vibration. Uh, it is happening fast. Business sense uh, is there. People are interested there because it can be a big money spinner as well in future. So something has been coming out in stem cells and age rate macrovision regeneration. In glaucoma, we are a bit far behind. I think five minutes is the time. Unless there is any more, I can take one more question. Yeah. The last time I came in for. Oh. Like text. I have put over this eye, which is, uh, was a cataract uh, in this eye. Uh, a, a blank lens with perforations. Tiny, tiny pinprick. Yeah. Can you tell me what that is? <coughs> that is essentially a pinhole test. You know, our, if you remember physics, if you read physics <laughs> many years ago. The, the, the center of the lens, if a ray, if light ray is passing through the center of the lens, it doesn't get deviated much. So if you got slight, so slight glasses, which if you require slight glasses, putting that pinhole can take care of that because most of the things are passing through the center of the lens. And that's why they go undeviated. undeviated. And that's how you get better vision with those tiny holes. So that's our way to check whether you require glasses or not, whether your vision can be improved or not, and that's a very, very good way. It doesn't work if you've got a thick central cataract because then it obstructs and it can make worse as well. But that's how it's based on the physics principle of deviation of light. So if you if the light is passing through the edge of the lens, when your pupil is bigger, whenever you have dilated your pupil, your vision goes blurred because there's lots of light and it's causing all sorts of blurring next. But when we construct it, the vision is better, and when we put the pinhole, it's even better. Okay, I think with that, I will just request you to give us a feedback. I will request you if we could put your comments on the website because to keep this website, no, for this lot of support group, I never ask for any donation or any money. What I say, just give me your feedback and keep attending and that will keep it going. So thank you very much for coming. I will call the meeting in close and thanks to Sally and Sarah and uh, uh, Harry who has been uh, doing the photography. Thank you John and thanks everyone for, and thanks uh, for IGA and Thank you very much.